All right, you guys, thanks for coming today. Um, I'm John from Zonguru. Um, this is our headquarters. We're based here in Los Angeles. And welcome to Amazon Seller Insights. Um, and basically what we do every month is we bring in a speaker, someone who is crushing it on Amazon. Um, and it's really just an opportunity for us to learn from uh, the, the, the speaker, get insights on the business, gain, ex you know, gain his expertise, and just use it to fuel your own Amazon business. So that's what we do. And uh, I'm really um, excited to have uh, Matt Loberstein, which most of you probably know here today, to talk about um, how to find a great product niche on Amazon, and then how do you take that niche and grow it into a million dollar Amazon brand. So it's a pretty lengthy topic, a pretty big chunk to take on today, but we definitely have an expert here in Matt um, to chat to us today. Uh, you know, uh, Matt's an e-commerce seller. He's been doing it on eBay for uh, many years. And then in the last three years, I think it's probably three and a half, three yeah. and a half years, he's been uh, selling on Amazon. Um, and he's, he's grown it into a seven figure a year Amazon business. And the way he's been able to do that, um, and he'll obviously tell you guys, but, but you know, he's really worked out how to find a, a great product niche um, and then actually create a great brand and then exponentially grow that through brand lines and product lines and just doing it in the right way. That's how you should be growing it uh, as, as an Amazon seller. Um, so yeah, Matt and I met uh, probably about three or four months ago at a meetup uh, and I really connected with him because the way he thinks about um, creating a brand on Amazon and growing it is, the, is similar to the way that, that I've thought about it and learned and done it with, with my Amazon brand, brands that I've, that I've got as well. I've been selling on Amazon for about four years now um, and uh, about two and a half years ago, just based on us needing um, some, you know, some software, we created Zonguru, um, which I'm the CEO and partner of. Um, and, uh, and you know, it's got about 10 different tools that you guys can use, so check it out. I think let's start just to, to give people a little bit of background. Maybe start with your Amazon journey. Where did you, you start? And, and, and tell us a little bit about that journey of how you got to maybe your first success where you're like, oh, damn, this thing is like, this is, this is, this is the shit. This is the way I should be. So yeah. can you give us a little bit of background? Yeah, first off, thanks for having me. I've been in the crowd, so it's cool to be up here. Yeah, um, absolutely. Great meetup. So, um, yeah, like you said in the intro, I started out on eBay just like dabbling, not really knowing what I was doing. That wasn't private label, that wasn't brand building, that was nothing of what I would say is correct now. So I've, I've rolled with the punches, I've learned as I've gone. It, mm -hmm. It's not like I just came out doing this what, the way I'm doing it now necessarily. But the reason that I looked for that transition was because that's such a tough game. It's like you're always just fighting on margin and you, know, you, you don't really own any brand, any actual equity in the products you're selling. You're just fighting with everyone else selling generic crap so yeah. that led me to just in like this concept of private label was a bit intuitive to me i guess i just because you remember how it was three and a half four years ago nobody was the, the term private label was not even really being just beginning to be really thrown around i would mm -hmm. say around that time and uh i just knew you know like look amazon's happening if you're if you're showing up if you've got the reviews if you're showing up and you have a good product offering i knew i knew there was something there and that was why I started to, to look into this thing in the first place was because I wanted something that was more protectable and scalable and repeatable, not me running around on Craigslist to sell stuff on eBay or not me just importing a bunch of generic stuff from AliExpress to sell it on eBay and uh, me and my girlfriend packing the labels on it from, from our uh, studio apartment floor. It, was just, it just wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a scalable actual business. So that led me to that. Uh, I, I took some of the stuff I was selling on eBay, learned the ropes of Amazon, you know, you, like at the beginning, you're all overwhelmed by the, the barcodes and the shipping and all that. Yeah. So I just took that product just as an experiment to kind of learn the ropes, uh, not really thinking it was even necessarily the right choice for Amazon, but learn the ropes with that. And then, um, uh, you know, just really started doing research into what would become what I consider my first actual product, which led to my first actual brand. And that, that one that I consider my first uh, took off right away. Uh, it really did. Right. So that was the first success was that that first branded product. It was something that I made more premium, had a higher price point than what was currently on the market. Um, all of that. And, and it just kept it just kept going. And then over the past three years, I've not only grown out that product line to probably that one probably has 15 or so products in it, uh, but I've also launched a second, third and fourth brands. And uh, the second brand is what became the main one, which is a lesson in itself, is mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm always looking for the next thing. And while I'm a huge proponent, as you mentioned, of building out the product brand, 
you also have to know when there's a bigger opportunity and that's the, gonna be the seed for brand number two. Gotcha. Yeah, I think there's a really good, uh, well, there's a lot of nuggets in that, but I think one that I picked up there is that, um, you know, you were trying to get, for those of you who are not selling on Amazon right now and you're doing your product research and you know, you, you're going through all of these phases, there's a, there's, a, there's a thing about just taking a product, any product and getting it onto Amazon. Because if you take any product, even if you sell one of them and go through the process of getting, on, getting it onto Amazon, you're in that two or 3% of Amazon sellers, those that actually have got something onto Amazon. So that was a, a super big nugget right there. Yeah. yeah, that's something I've just started to like talk about recently was that, like I, I hadn't realized just how big of a holdup that is. And so I told the story in a recent video that I made of that first product that wasn't, it was just like, I was selling like phone accessories and stuff on eBay, like screen protectors. Yeah. Like it wasn't, it wasn't anything like what I'm doing now. And so I just took that, put it on Amazon, learned the process. So then, yeah, I mean, it, it, it saw, like then when I went and did it for real, all of those little details, that's, that's where 95% of the people are, are held up is like, you know, what's the FN SKU? And like, you know, like those, those little details are at the beginning, that's really overwhelming. But once you've done it, that's the, like, you, it's like a no brainer once you've done it, those yeah, things. So absolutely. Totally agree. And I think the second one, and we'll probably get into this more that, that I picked up there is that, you know, when he started to sell one of his real brands, he sold it at a premium, you know, and, and don't go into Amazon thinking, I need to compete on price, obviously, um, and, and, and really compete at that level. You've got to be able to create a brand and a brand has value, which you can sell at a higher price and, and have a premium there. So um, really, really two important things. But so, so let's move on to product selection. Um, you know, you've obviously launched those products. You, you've had wins with some great products. You've probably had some good failures as well, like, like we all do. But For sure. um, you know, f focusing on the wins, what are some of the strategies that you, um, that you would implement to select uh, a great product or a great product niche? What are some of the top five things or a few things that you think are really yeah. important? Yeah, I have a few different ways of 20 looking. bucks. <laughs> I, I have a f 20 another bucks. 20 bucks. <laughs> Getting rich up here. Yeah. <laughs> you can quit Amazon then. Yeah, uh, yeah, so there's a few different ways that I look about it. And I think this has evolved too, because truthfully, when I had launched the majority of my brands, this was you know, a few years ago, I wasn't using any software. I wasn't using any tools. I was just poking around and you know, taking risks and doing just what I felt like, you know, I'd be digging around on Amazon, which is still a strategy that I do immensely. And I think it's so simple yet overlooked is just spend hours digging through on Amazon, looking at everything, looking at the storefronts, looking at the frequently bought together, looking at the sponsored, looking at obviously the search results, like just looking at everything and evaluating everything. Cause then you're just going to go down this, ma this major rabbit hole of new potential ideas. And the way I look at it is that feeds the top of the funnel. The evaluation is what really matters. So the top of the funnel is like, you know, you can get an idea from anywhere. Like I'm, I, I barely talk about that because I feel like that is just the entry point. Mm -hmm. It's like that to me can be anything. Like it could be, you know, something that's on this table or something at home or something you just see or something you hear, you see on Instagram or, you know, something you find on Amazon, you're digging around. Any of those are cool in my book. Uh, but digging into that funnel and really like evaluating it within the parameters of Amazon is what is important to me and the two main the two biggest pieces of that I, I do have like sort of like a five sort of standard things but the, the two main ones are existing sales volume and there's tools that allow you to literally look on Amazon and figure out how much is this selling like we can reverse engineer that obviously it's an estimate but like that is crazy in itself <laughs> that you can like look yeah. at a product on Amazon and be like, oh, that's doing this much revenue. Like so what do you, when you say existing sales on Amazon, if you look at a product, what is the, the, the kind of the level that you, the minimum level that you want to be seeing on a monthly mm -hmm. revenue from a product to make right. it attractive? Right. So uh, this will be in balance with number two. And, and so it's not an exact because to me, it's like, am I going for a big win or am I going for an easy, low opportunity win? So mm -hmm. in some cases that might be you know, five to 10 grand, it's just small. I mean, that's, that's considered like a relatively small product. But if I think it fits in with my brand, if it's very low competition, I think it's basically no risk, I'll throw in one of those. And maybe it's low investment too. So low, low investment, low risk, but relatively low upside. On the other hand, I might sometimes go after products that I think could do potentially 50 or 100K a month, but probably requires a lot more investment. Mm -hmm probably a lot more risk because it's going to be more competitive. So I'll, personally, I do both. So I'm not a huge fan of like the set criteria method uh, 
because I do both. Like I have, I have some really small wins that I just accumulate a big portfolio of, you know, mm -hmm. 500 bucks here, a thousand bucks here. And you know, you get 20, 30 of those and it's, it's not bad. And then, you know, I have a few home runs, if you, you would say that do quite a bit more. And then I have some duds. So, uh, I don't have an exact, but yeah, I would say, you know, I don't like to put it exact, but somewhere around the 10 to 50,000 range. I mean, that's broad, but like, gotcha. that's kind of the range I'm playing depending on number two, which is, this is the nuanced point, which is learning to evaluate the, the competition, like the layout. And um, this just comes down to how big is the market and how many players are there, right? Mm -hmm. can, and the way I like to look at it is just a very simple overview is like, can I fit in here? <laughs> like, it's super basic, but is there room for you in that, in that, in that market? Like, can you picture yourself in the, somewhere in the middle? You know, a lot of people that come to me, two big problems. So this will be two sub points, but gotcha. one, one big problem is the market's just dead. It's just too small. It's not even worth playing. Uh, the other is that it's, it's, it's not balanced. They're, they're shooting to be number one, which I, that's not my strategy. That's some people's strategy. How can I, you know, give away the number one on the ranking for that? Keyword. Like literally number, number one, one seven, like, yeah. like you're looking at the search results and it's like, 12,000 revenue, $1,500, $600. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're banking on being number one. I'd rather like throw a dart and hit 15K rather than like try to be number one and do, you know what I mean? Like it, it has to do with that mix and finding the right balance of how many sellers are doing what you'd be happy doing and how many are dead in the water below that. And that has to feel right. And then beyond that, I would dig through and try to figure out what are they doing wrong? or what are they doing right? If there's some that I can point to and be like, well, I think these few are really successful because they're doing this, that, and these little details, and I can play it, and I can just see them as my only competitors, really, then that could work. Uh, on the other hand, if I see one that's just doing terrible, but I'm like, oh, well, their listing is the worst thing I've ever seen, then I'm like, eh, it doesn't, that, that's, that, that doesn't influence me as much at that point. So to me, those are like, that is like the core of like the, the standard sort of Amazon landscape part of product research. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, um, I can breeze through the other points, which is just like, you got to stand out in some way. Differentiation. Right. You, it, like, like we were talking about the higher price point or, uh, I mean, price is a factor. Price is a differentiation for sure. It's just not a good one to play with usually as far as going lower, but it's possible. Uh, but yeah, usually finding some way to, to brand yourself, to market yourself better, to have a genuine, a, a product that is genuinely, um, has an edge. And the way I think about that is, would you buy your own product? <laughs> it's very simple, but we're, probably everyone in here buys stuff on Amazon, probably. And like having that customer lens and just, you know, if you're like, that's something that I get a lot of people asking me. It's like, you know, oh, my product's not selling. It's like, well, if you wouldn't choose your own one, like why are you having this expectation that like other people are going to? Like, like your product, it, it's such a basic, like sort of fundamental business thing, but like if, you're, if your product is not a good offer, <laughs> people aren't going to want it, you know? Yeah, it's like, a, it's like my, my business partner, Adam, he, he always says like, Amazon is like the Tinder for products, you know? <laughs> and uh, and if, if, you, if you're not gonna look at it and visually be like, I'm in love with this thing, I need to buy it now, then you've got some work to do, you know? So, so you've really gotta look through the, the, in that lens and say, how would someone as a customer really choose my product over anything else then? So, so different, differentiation visually, as well as um, you know, through product differentiation and a whole bunch of stuff is, is super important. And the important. listing itself. Yeah, I mean, listing, absolutely. Like in some cases, you're not gonna be able to do major R&D ground up engineering for your product from the beginning. You might invest yes. in those things later as you get profits from your more private label wins to roll into the more intense uh, physical changes because sometimes those could just get expensive. But so then your game is like, yeah, how do you just position yourself? in such a way and hopefully have something of like real tangibleness also. But uh, yeah, a lot of that just comes down to having that look of well-rounded legitimacy that gives the co customer confidence. I want that over gotcha. the other ones. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, so I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of questions around, uh, you know, how to, how to really like pick your idea and, and how to stand out. So we'll, we'll come back to that and, and open that to audiences. But, um, you know, moving on from, let's say now you find like a great product opportunity. You've, you've gone through, you know, looking at a bunch of stuff. You've, you've pulled out the, 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 the great ways of differentiating it. You're sitting at the middle of page one and there's still a lot of volume there and you think you can compete there. So you've, you've chosen this product. Um, how, do you, how do you take that and then start to grow that into a brand? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and 
exponentially grow that brand. So, so what are some of your bigger tips um, around the brand part of it and saying, okay, I've got a product that's selling well, how mm -hmm. do I grow that into a brand? So, and when I, brand maybe is, you can have a brand from the start, but a, when I say brand, it's not just one product. It's, it's, right. it's, so, it's a bigger halo effect of, of having products. Yeah, I like to say that like, you might, brand is like a heady concept and figure out like product line first, probably in most cases. Like, yeah. you know, you'll, brand can emerge in a way. But um, as far as how do I get that one winning product into a brand, I would actually back up and say that that's part of my initial selection. So that's one of my right. initial product research criteria is I'm already doing research into what would be, you know, what does this look like if it's a, a $10 million brand? Not that I've built a $10 million brand yet, hey, but you uh, dream, you we'll dream. see. I mean, the next one I'm shooting even bigger, but, um, nice. but uh, you know, being able to envision what, like, is this a product that could be like, are there brands in the world that are a hundred million dollars that are in this, in this industry, you know, and like, how have they branched out? There has to be some thread through the products. Maybe that's that they solve the same problem for people or they, um, you know, they're for the same utility. Like the obvious one everyone always uses is like cooking, you know, like maybe they all sort of fit the same thing like that. Maybe they're all tied together in the fact that they, um, they're like similar materials and it has to do with like a premium thing like that. Or it could even be uh, aesthetic. There's a lot of just, you know, design brands that just have like a common theme throughout their brand. Or, uh, or, or that even ties into just having like a, a overall mission of the brand. And it's like, you know, products that do this for the home or whatever. And then it could be anything that sort of fits into that. And that's how brand emerges from product line. So for product line, and, and the way that, that I start there is once again, diving in on Amazon is a great way. You look at the products that you're considering selling, you see what is frequently bought together. Amazon gives us a ridiculous amount of information like right there. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm evaluating those criteria to determine if this one product is viable, which is very important, like brand is great, but individual product opportunity is like, St like, it still has to check that box, you know, Absolutely. it has to. Yeah. But then the next sort of check before I approve it would be, you know, can I find three to five or 10 or 15 products that eventually would fit this product line and could serve a similar market or help people with the same problem or build an audience around this sort of uh, interest or topic or problem or mission. And that's baked into the equation from the very beginning. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and I think, I think a good tip there is that um, when you think about that line or that family of products, um, this is something that actually you, you chatted to me about a while back and it resonated with me is, is, is choose a supplier who can potentially fulfill that line of products. Yes. Because, you know, I've, I've, it's not a mistake, it's probably one of my best sellers, but I chose a supplier who only does that one thing. And, uh, and so when that's working really well, how do you, to, to expand that line, you have to find a different supplier, you have to kind of go through the whole process again. Yeah. Whereas if you've done all that hard work and you found the right supplier, um, it's so easy then to say, hey, this is working, what else do you have? What else do you have? What else do you have? And then you, you, you're building that line and your, your turnaround and your, your growth in terms of having products is, is, is massive. So that's, that's a really big tip that we've talked about before that uh, I think if you're starting to sell on Amazon is, is something you should look at, yeah. Yeah, that's a gigantic tip is to like build a long-term relationship with your supplier, like f only for that product, but in general too, is like, you know, tell them we're looking to expand into this, this and that. And if you just find some random trading company that has, you know, iPhone cases and spatulas or whatever, like they're not going to be the one that can develop new products with you potentially in the future, or just offer you this style and that style and this other size and this other product that's, you know, made out of the same material. So yeah, I mean, while when it's necessary, I'll go to another supplier, of course, uh, but I have, I have way more products than I have suppliers, for, if that makes sense. So yes, meaning I have multiple SKUs that come from each supplier and yeah. that's intentional. And that, that's another way, like, the, like looking on Amazon to see what it's bought together is just having that conversation with your supplier, seeing what's out there. Maybe they have something, maybe, this is a big tip too, maybe they have something that already is a differentiation that allows you to stand out and they're just not offering it to you because it's you know, a dollar more expensive and they're worried that you're not gonna want that because typically they're just selling the cheapest one. So maybe all the ones on Amazon are this cheap one or whatever, but you're like, oh, can you make this, you know, like a little thicker or a higher grade of, of, of 
material or like you know stuff like that and they're like oh yeah we have that but it's not it's the it's not the popular one like don't you want the cheap one like i've had that experience a ton of times and they might have your differentiation there and it's just now it's just your job to like bring that into the market and market it and brand it as that that's your positioning it's and they might already have it so that might even save you all the more complicated r d that you can do later when you have more money to reinvest into those things yeah yeah no that's a great tip i think like especially if you're dealing with suppliers in china um frequently you'll have a conversation where they're like you know, they, they're offering you what they think is the best seller because it's the cheapest. And if you flip that conversation and you say to them, hey, what's the craziest thing that you have there that, that is twice as expensive? Right. Or if I give you 20% more money, what can you deliver on me? It's a different way of thinking and they'll come to you with, with ideas that you might not even know were there. So, yeah. um, you know, that whole idea of premium and, and, and speaking to your supplier around, around premium is, is, is a really important tip yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah, it's huge. Yeah. And then... Um, yeah, another one that you, that you mentioned is, is your supplier, if you find one, is potentially a relationship for, for five to 10 years to 15 years. Yeah. So, you know. Or sold with your business. Yeah. You know, the relationship. So, so uh, <laughs> you know, going to, um, you know, those conversations with, with the supplier around getting to know them, um, you know, treating them as family, you know, working together as a team and, and not just grinding on price or, you know, um, treating it as a buyer-supplier relationship where, where it's not met much more of a family so i think yeah. it's, it's a really important point yeah yeah definitely like that's why I, I usually say you know be careful negotiating too hard because then it's like they're just gonna see you as a transaction and i'm always saying like you know you know maybe you start with only the the 500 pieces or a thousand pieces but you know tell them like if this goes well we're gonna order 2500 pieces or like you know we're gonna we're trying to be the best brand of this in the space and get mm. them on board and they get the, like then they'll be planning they want to grow with you so if you can like paint that picture of the supplier growing with you they're going to be way more invested in you and they're not they're going to they're not going to just like you know cheat you on that initial transaction send you crap quality and just think you're like going away if they've been if you've sold them on the idea that you're going to be growing with them for like you said maybe five ten years even gotcha gotcha perfect um okay so we, we're gonna move on to some other questions and then we'll wrap up and open it up to you guys um, so let's say you've created a brand, you're selling on Amazon. Um, there's many different levers that you have on, on Amazon to, to push your product. You, you know, you have listing optimization, you have, um, outside traffic, you have, uh, PPC, you have, you have all of these things mm -hmm. to really drive your business. What is, what do you say are the most important levers when it comes to really optimizing your sales on, yeah. on Amazon? So I would say all those things are what I would consider necessary. Uh, you have to do listing optimization. You have to learn PPC. Uh, outside traffic, you'll get there. You might not necessarily yeah, from, need right. It. Like you might not need that from the beginning, but you should think about that. But what I would say has been the biggest lever for me is not doing that. <laughs> and well, sorry, let me rephrase: doing that, but not focusing on that. Like that's the require. That's just like duh. Like you have to do that. But the thing that is the biggest lever is launching another product, in my opinion. Like, you know, you could optimize, yeah. yeah, you can, you can optimize to death, but if you like, you know, you know, tweaking that one product from 12 sales a day to 14 sales a day, or what if you just launch another product and it's another eight sales a day or 10 sales a day? I mean, it's just like, so to me, I mean, I still have some products that are not as nearly as optimized as they could be because they're just rolling along and doing their thing and I'm just focused elsewhere, you know? So to me, the biggest lever is simply that expansion thing. And even better if it's within the brand, but don't be limited only to that because sometimes there's gonna be the seed for your second brand, a bigger opportunity outside your brand. But um, yeah, I mean, if I just look back in my business, like absolutely the things that have been the biggest levers are just launching another product. More than like, you know, oh, I did this one little, Let's do some Facebook yeah. ads or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and I do that stuff and that stuff's important, but um, I haven't, at, at least in my experience, I haven't had one of those be like the major paradigm shift of the business. It's mm. been more just that like those things have allowed everything to continue on and, and, yeah, and get a little better and better. And maybe that's just, maybe I need to dive even deeper <laughs> into some of those things myself. But um, for me, the biggest lever has been, has been just more products. Like, you know, going from one product to five to 10 to 40, whatever I'm at now. So Gotcha. Yeah, and that goes back to that whole thing of choosing your supplier. If you're starting out, you know, if you can choose a supplier where it's easy to grow that range, you're already ahead of the game. You know, I, if I remember back to, 
to when I started, I had a successful product, but it took me maybe six months before I launched my next. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, once you have a, your first product and it's live, the best thing you can do to your point is launch your next product and yeah, launch your start next product. And, you know, all the many together make, make, it, make a much bigger number. So, yeah. um, and if they're related products, under the same kind of buyer keywords, now all of a sudden you're taking up more room on the search results page and they're all kind of tied together. So there's a lot of ways that, that it really helps, yeah. Yeah, that's one of my like biggest secrets is like the first place to look for your second product is like competing with yourself, I like to say. Nice. It's like, like you said, more real estate. Like don't go from, like, and you already know it works. So it's like gonna be even less risk. You've already like learned that market, you know, you know how PPC works in that market, you know the keywords, all this stuff. So it's just like, do another one. <laughs> and then like, there's always the fear of it cannibalizing a little, but in my experience, like, I mean, if that happens by five or 10%, it still doesn't matter if you're having an, another entire SKU that over the course, I've had it happen that that SKU becomes the main SKU, you know, like for sure. I've had the second one become bigger than the first one. And many, my second brand is bigger than the first brand. Uh, I have, yeah, I mean, in one of my brands, I think it was like the, the third or the fourth product that's like kind of the biggest one in that brand. So, yeah. Nice. So, uh, maybe a quick tip. Do you look at individual listings or do you look at variations when it comes to variations on a specific mm. product? Yeah, uh, both. Uh, though I think I personally, in many cases, favor having another listing when it makes sense. Like when it's not just like completely silly to have another listing, I'd probably in most cases prefer to have another listing. So, um, but then I do have some that are just like, you know, really basic stuff. Like if it's in some cases, if it's like a quantity variation or a color, I'll often do that just as a variation. To me, the way I look at that issue is like, if, if this is a, uh, like if this can dominate the search results, if this can be another style in the search results, I'm going to go with another listing all day because it's that real estate thing. Right. Uh, whereas like, if I just want to give my exist, if I just want to serve my existing customers a little bit better and give them another option, like, like a color or something minor, in those cases, I'll, I'll, I'll go with a variation. But I would say overall, I'm more in favor of like having another listing. You, you get, it, it varies by category, but you know, you get to show up in the frequently bought together. I mean, you just, you start showing up everywhere once you have this synergy going on. So I personally favor that in most cases, but not all. Gotcha. So, you know, there's quite a lot for people to take in if they aren't sitting on Amazon yet. But, you know, if you're creating a brand, if you're, um, you know, thinking about creating this whole massive brand and this line of products and you, you want to get onto Amazon, what, what is like your best piece of advice for someone who's starting? Um, where should they focus first? You know, what, what gets them off the ground? Yeah, um, two, two little points. I think the first is what you touched on earlier about just like nobody, like so many people won't even get to the point of ever sending something into Amazon FBA. So that's something I've been talking more on recently just because, yeah, I mean, that's the major holdup. I mean, there are people that have, you know, made a dollar on Amazon, even if it's at a loss. And then there are a lot of people who have never even got that far. So I think that's super key, you know, send something in. <laughs> so I think that's a big one, but I think like, um, the biggest holdup or, or, or like mistake is, or just most important tip. It, it's in, it's in the thing that everyone wants to always talk about, which is choosing the right product. I mean, it's like talked about to death, but, uh, that as a whole is 90 plus percent of, of, your success. I mean, back to the optimized thing, you can optimize the wrong product like forever and it may just continue. It may just never work. Whereas some products you might just throw it up and it kind of takes off and you're like, cool. So, uh, you know, finding that right product that you you're confident in the existing sales, uh, you, uh, it has that right balance such that you think you can actually fit in and, you know, throw the dart and get in there and, uh, be happy with it already be looking for the portfolio because the portfolio is how you're going to grow in my opinion and and you know have that plan for for building out a brand all of that all of that before you place that order <laughs> awesome awesome yeah and i think adding to that like we we talk about as entrepreneurs we talk about the, the dip i don't know if you guys have read that book by seth godin called the dip but basically the, the the concept is is that you know as you start a project it gets much tougher so you'll end up going through this big dip where you're working hard you're doing whatever it is but you never want to quit when you're in the dip because you've lost all that real estate and all that time of actually trying to create a brand so or a product or taking on a pro project or whatever it is so you know the key there is that if you are going to start on amazon and you're going to launch a product give it your all make sure that you're the best and give it the best shot like don't say oh, i want to rank on page two i'm just gonna you know do whatever you know you really want to give everything 
that you can to get that product as, as, as best as you can to compete, to stay on that page one and get the sales. So, so yeah. going there with like, when I'm in and I'm going, I've got to be the best I can be out of everyone. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely add that to, to what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. And like, in being willing to risk some money, I think is a big, is a big one. Like, like if you're not willing to really go for it like that, you're less likely to succeed. So if, if you're being like really timid with, you know, 500, 1,000, 1,500 bucks or something, that to me is more risky than somebody that's like, all right, let's like really give this a shot and like throw some dollars at it and just like, you know, be okay with that financial risk for, for the potential upside. So. Yeah, and a way to look at that sometimes is to, to think about how much money you will make if you put this much in, right. you know, so it's look insane. at the ROI. Yeah, I mean, like say. the ability that, yeah, like that's insane. Because like I get bombarded with a lot of questions that are like, you know, well, the, the quintessential question of like, how much money do I need to start on Amazon? Like you probably get it a lot mm -hmm. too. And it's just like, um, yeah, I mean, even if it's, even if we said it was 10 grand, which you can get away with less than that, for, I would say. Uh, but like, even if it was 10 grand, like the ability to potentially build a multi-million dollar business, starting with a $10,000 in investment, you know, like from your laptop, like any, like, I mean, that's like, like, this is a pretty cool game that we're playing. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, that 10 grand, you could yeah. potentially 3X that in just a few months, you know? Yeah. Then you have 3X that to then invest and grow. So yeah, then it's, 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 then it's one product to three yeah. products to 10 products and yeah. yeah. All right, so we'll come back to Amazon in a second, but you know, as an entrepreneur, which, which you obviously are, um, you know, uh, it can be a lonely journey, it can be an amazing journey, but what's, what's your entrep entrepreneurial mindset in terms of how you approach your day um, to really get the best out of yourself for, for your business? Yeah, this is something that's definitely changed a lot, I would say, from the beginning. Like, in the, in the early days, I was starting this business actually while I was still in college, uh, so I didn't know what day of the week it was. I mean, I was just like, <laughs> you know, I was in that zone, which uh, probably helps in the beginning, but probably not the most healthy thing or anything like that. But also like down to like, like mindset as an entrepreneur is back then, uh, my, my goal was different too. Like my, my initial goal was like, look, it was, it was financial freedom, not even in the sense of like getting rich or whatever. It was like, I just want to be able to own my own thing. Like I don't want to like have to respond to anybody. I just want to do my own thing. I want to be able to like, you know, go visit my family or whatever if I want to. So like for me, like that was my initial goal. Like I'd rather make, you know, 30 grand for myself than 300 grand for someone else like all day. Like that's just, I, nobody can offer me. Like there's like no job I would accept basically. Um, anyways though, I would say it's changed now. And uh, you know, now I, as far as structuring my time and my day, like, you know, I've been in this a while. I've planted seeds a lot of years ago that are harvested now. So I've worked quite a bit less in the last year, year and a half, you know? Um, and now as I'm trying to like ramp up and do some even, you know, more projects and get into other business, cause I've always seen Amazon as a lever in itself, mm -hmm. a means to an end. Like, like Amazon is a great opportunity, but I've seen it as like a cash flow play more than like, you know, this is the thing that's going to define who I am as an entrepreneur. As, like, like this is like, you know, how I went from like, broke college kid to like somebody who could invest in a business that is something I want to see play out for the next 10 or 20 years. And that's like the shift that I'm starting to experience. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to like really dial in on like focusing my day. Like I start, I got like, like a journal and planner and like, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm not an expert at this stuff. Like I waste a lot of time. Um, I think it was like, uh, I think like Tim Ferriss, like I'm sure a lot of people follow Tim Ferriss and like he seems like the most productive dude ever and like you know he's just like made it but like he he says on his podcast like if you guys were to like you know follow me around for a day you'd be like what the hell is wrong with this guy like he just like sat there for four hours doing like that I mean that's you know a lot of Jessica can attest to that uh, like yeah. you know like uh yeah I mean I've I've been chilling but I'm trying to um I'm working on that yeah, I guess yeah. is the answer but as far as mindset just to rant a little bit more on that is like my mind should has has completely shifted. At first it was like, you know, super small, even though like I had that mindset, mindset shift from, you know, college kid or employee to like, whoa, like I can do this for myself. I was still thinking small, like the concept of a million dollar business was still mind blowing when I, even when I started my Amazon business. But now like I, now I'm beginning to be able to get my head around what a hundred million dollar business would look like. And, and I feel like that's sort of the next shot I want to take. And you know, if I, if I miss it and land at 30 million, it's like, like you know, it's just a different game. Like, so now I think, now I see like entrepreneurship as just literally 
like a vehicle to create things in the world and like build massive things that are bigger than yourself. And that's where I feel myself shifting is just from like this, whoa, crazy life changing cash flow thing that allowed me to like, you know, build the lifestyle I want to now like leveling that into how can I really create something that, that I want to exist and be passionate about and really get behind. So that was long, but that's kind of my no, that's, entrepreneurial that's mindset. Awesome, yeah. and, and that's, a good summary of the the evolution of a successful entrepreneur someone yeah. who's essentially starting at broke uh and is just worried about really getting the money on the table and and building something small right. uh to building something successful where your 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 constant evolution of learning you're starting to now look at okay well now i want to create something that has impact on the world exactly and yeah. then how is it that something that i can create value um and then if and it becomes like you know um you know charitable and, and there's a whole big evolution that happens along the way and I think that's an amazing journey to be on and, and you know us as young people who are potentially just first time entrepreneurs uh, in this day and age like you've got to be in that space like the world is getting so much more competitive you know it's growing so fast that if you're just sitting there and working for someone without at least on the side trying to grow your own thing um, you know, you, you're missing a massive opportunity right now. So I could go down a huge rabbit hole and it's like, I think it's literally insane to not be doing it. Yeah. Like how people are like, Oh, you're like, you know, taking all these risks and stuff. I'm like, you're crazy. Like <laughs> you're taking a huge risk. Like where's your job going to be in like 30 and 20. I mean, like it's, it's really crazy. It, it gets, yeah. we could, we could for sure go there, but yeah, you have to be doing it. It's like, it's your obligation to like build wealth such that you can impact the world in the way that you want to impact the world. Yeah. Uh, and I, and yeah, I definitely didn't have that mindset at the beginning. Like, you know, I had the, the poor mindset of just like, Oh, you know, money is just whatever. And like, uh, but then, you know, when you realize that money can be used to literally shape the world, then it's like a different game. So, and yeah, I, and I totally agree too about like seeing entrepreneurs sort of bridge that gap. And that's the gap that I'm, obsessed with right now because I see that in so many entrepreneurs that I follow that are obviously like, you know, way ahead of my level. And they all, they all go through that progression. It's like once they've, you know, got their own game locked down, then it's like, what's the bigger thing that's literally like, you know, legacy impact, all those, all those things. So, brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Uh, so may maybe we end with, um, YouTube. So you've got a, you've got a <laughs> YouTube channel and you've got some YouTube followers. Uh, you know, what's that like? You enjoy it? It's, it's a lot of work. You get a lot of value out of it. What's, what's, what's it, what's it about? Yeah. Um, yeah, I started it not even a year ago and it just, it took off a lot faster than I expected. So I got that idea in my head from Gary V who probably a lot of people follow. And, uh, you have a picture you met him. Yeah. I've met him twice. Oh, cool. Uh, that was cool. Uh, I was nervous meeting him. <laughs> he's like, is he going to kill me? He's intense. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, he's just really, really intense, but he, he's cool. He got that idea in my head of just like, my initial thought was like, look, if I can build an, I thought it'd be way slower. Like I thought it would take, you know, years and years and years to have like any amount of audience. And my thought was just that, like, look, that's, that's leverage for something. And I don't know yet what the impact, like I, I thought maybe, maybe in five years I'll be building a business and it'd be cool if there are people interested in what I'm doing as a business person and as a, as a person, person too. And just to have people, that, that was kind of my original thought. Now it led to, um, and this is a mindset thing too, is it led to people being way more impressed with my story than I expected. <laughs> like I, yeah, it's um, a total mindset thing. yeah, so I was just, um, I actually like just made a post about this like today or yesterday, but it was like on, on Facebook, but it was just like, uh, I think my mindset has always been that like, I'm not impressed with myself. And I think that, you know, maybe not the best thing for like, you know, celebrating and all that, but like, I think that's what's allowed me to always set the bar higher is that like, I don't think anything that I've done is that crazy. I think if you think it's crazy, then that's your small mindset thinking it's you're like you're, you're suppressing your own sort of mindset of what you think is possible. So, um, yeah, I've lost yeah, you, just, you, <laughs> no, basically, yeah. you basically decide to give it a shot and, yeah. and try it on Amazon and, and you were surprised that, you know, people have reacted yeah. so, so much better than, than what you potentially thought you would get. Right. So, so that was what happened was that like, you know, I just kind of thought like, oh yeah, I've, you know, built it to this level and like, I'm just kind of showing my thing and people were just like, how did you do this? How did you do this? Like, teach me this more and more. Like, it was just it kind of like just ramped up really, really quickly. So I started, you know, consulting and teaching and, you know, all of that type of stuff just emerged out of it and it grew a lot faster. And it's, you know, it's, there's, there's financial aspects to it for sure that I thought would take 
again, five, 10 years to see, like I was, I was investing in it. I, I started with an editor from day one. Like I didn't edit my first video on YouTube. Uh, so I just thought like, look, I'm looking at this as an investment for the future of just like building up some sort of leverage, helping people and having a platform for whatever it is. Like I said, like I follow like, like Tim Ferriss or Gary Vee, like the thing that all those people have in common is you're looking at them. So, uh, and that idea just got in my head is like, uh, their ability to impact again, like their ability to like kickstart something or, you know, sway the world a little bit because of influence is interesting, especially in the business sense, like more than just like vanity, like followers or something like that. But like, you know, to have real impact and people that are along for your journey was, that was my real sort of plan from the beginning with it. Yeah. When you, when you get a thank you message from someone who's like, I listen to you and I, started my business and I'm making $2,000 a month or whatever it is on Amazon, that's, that's yeah. good impact and, and an, that's an amazing That's crazy. Feeling. I mean, yeah. like that, um, I probably took for granted before it happened because everyone says that stuff. It's like, oh yeah, it feels so good to help you. But then when you get, when you start getting those messages like every day, you're like, whoa. And the one thing I would say if anyone's like considering starting a YouTube channel or something is that it happens way faster than I expected. Like you would think, oh, you need, you know, a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred thousand subscribers to get, to start getting messages like that. I think I had like, you know, I mean, I was getting like 30, 40, 50 views on my video, but I was, I started to get messages like that sometimes. And I'm like, Whoa, like, wait a second. Like, you know, I had like 75 subscribers or whatever. And, uh, you start getting those messages. So it doesn't take as, you don't have to hit. And I, my numbers aren't like, you know, anything crazy, uh, by any means, but, uh, yeah, you, you hit that impact stride pretty quickly. And in, and if you can make impact on even one person, like that's, <laughs> that's pretty big ROI, you know, you don't need necessarily millions to feel like you're doing something worthwhile. Yeah. And so, so in a nutshell, this is kind of the beginning for you, you're already making impact. And so it's going to be really cool to see where you go with everything and listening to you along that journey. Cause you know, you, you look like the person who's going to want to learn and evolve along the way. So, and set your, set your bar high and, and go for it. So yeah, it's like literally awesome like, step one of infinity right now. Awesome. So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, guys, that, that's going to be the, the interview part of it. So thank you for that. And we'll switch it over to the floor. So if you guys have questions, um, yeah, thank you for that. Good job. Thanks. Who's got questions? One here, one there, one there. Just maybe give the, the one and give the second to the next person. Good. Good, good two questions to kick it off. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, first one, brand registry. Um, it's one of those details that comes with time. I think it's important, but it's not to me. I would say, don't worry about it. If you've just launched your brand, like, you know, get it going. You need a registered trademark to start that process, which having a registered trademark is not just starting the process of a registered trademark. It's waiting for it to go through it's time. It's like nine months, I think is what, at least at my more recent experience was like nine months. I mean, it takes a long time. It's like a 800, seven, 800 bucks, something like that. Depending if you do it yourself, I wouldn't do it yourself. I would say that's my personal thing. Some people try to file it themselves. I would say like, that's the type of thing you want to make sure it's filed correctly. And you're actually being protected for what you think you are. So, you know, go through like an intellectual property uh, lawyer to get your, your trademark filed. Uh, but anyways, like, you know, it's one of those things that it's going to be a small, it's going to be a small lever. It's worth doing once you have a brand that is protectable to answer your question about my own personal ones. They're not all brand registered. I, some of them are, but not all of them, uh, just cause like I haven't got around to it and it's like a pretty minor thing. And 
uh, I'm not having many issues. You know, uh, if you've differentiated, then having the main reason is hijackers. A hijacker is like when somebody jumps onto your listing claiming they're selling your product, but it's really not. And then all of a sudden you're competing to get them off and all of that type of stuff. So brand registry is one thing that can help uh, give you some leverage of getting them off because you're because Amazon has this uh, official registration that you're you are the brand owner and therefore like you are the authorized seller of that product so and it gives you some other things some other things too like enhanced brand content so that's how you get like the photos and the list in the description and all of that yeah so those things will impact you know that that falls into like that that uh, that listing optimization conversation it's gonna it's gonna make a tweak uh, but to me I don't see it as one of those like mandatory things at least from the beginning if your brand is starting to take off and you're at that and you're thinking whoa like yeah this is important and this is the brand i'm gonna stick with because sometimes i test stuff you know that's how i ended up with multiple brands they're not all great like but some of them are and those ones are brand registered so i didn't bother to uh do it like from from stage one on all of them and i would say it's i don't know if i'd say it's a waste of time and money but i would say it's not necessary right away but it's important to do like once you once you get to that stage uh yeah and, and yeah you know i think enhanced brand content can help with conversion because you have the opportunity to have more images and videos and that kind of stuff and obviously conversion helps to helps out spikes the algorithm which, right. which obviously makes you rank better but i think even without enhanced brand content you can achieve a very similar conversion rate by differentiating your product and also visually differentiating it with overlays and benefits and that kind of stuff yeah. where you can achieve in the a, main a, photos a, yeah in the main photos you can you can overlay with benefits and stuff which i think can give you a similar effect to the other pages that that enhance brand content gets so exactly yeah. um and then the second one um was the second question oh it was around uh hitting that point about competing with amazon uh yeah so just to clarify you mean do you mean that amazon would get into your same niche with their own product or that they would literally like hijack your brand? No, not hijack your okay. brand. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't worry about that. Uh, well, I don't worry about either of them. I just want to clarify, but I don't worry about either of those at all. When they see you're really super successful uh, with that particular brand, just like what Costco does with, you know, sure, yeah. product. Sure, yeah. I mean, if you hit that point, happy days, man. You, you, yeah, you're, you're probably, doing, you're probably doing really well if Amazon yeah. is coming after you in yeah. that regard. I mean, it would have to be, you know, I don't know, a million a month. I mean, to even, I would, I would think. I, it's not something that I hear about. It's, uh, and if Amazon goes into it too, like, look, they're, they're, uh, they're, they don't have your brand. That's why brand is so important. And like one question that might come to people a lot sooner, which is similar to this question, is when you're, when you're searching for competitors, oh, what if Amazon is, one of the, is, is a seller? Or what if there's an Amazon brand of the product you're looking to get into? And to me, and some people might disagree, to me, like, I don't care. Like, as long as it overall makes sense in that picture. Like, if, again, if they're the only ones doing well and no one else is doing well, well, then that already failed the test. So don't compete with Amazon in that case. But if Amazon is a seller and they have their own brand, they're doing well, but so is this guy and that guy, and this guy's sort of doing what I want to do, and I can do it better than that one. Like, well, now it, it's just another piece of the, it's just another piece of the game. So I don't, I don't, personally, like I think basically zero about that issue personally. Yeah, and I, I think the stats something crazy like eighty percent of Amazon's revenue comes from third-party sellers rather than the Amazon Basics line and stuff. So you know, there's I wouldn't worry about that yeah. that at all. And they're um, basics. They're usually like more of a consumables and more of a generics and cheap. And, and once again, that's why like we both sort of agree on like playing the premium game. Because uh, I've, I mean, I know Amazon has some other brands uh, like not Amazon Basics, but they have like their own uh, private label brands. And I'm not sure if some of those are premium. Maybe I, I don't I don't know enough about them. But uh, it seems like they're playing less of the premium game. And even if they were, same would apply as as what I was saying a minute ago. Is like as long as that picture still is balanced, uh, you know, just jump in. Who else got a mic? Any questions? <coughs> yeah. <coughs> um, when you're starting a new product and you're getting your supply and you're just starting out this new product on Amazon, what are some of the key things that you do to sort of jumpstart that product? And gain some traction on that new product? More like a launch process? So, so when you said about supplier, though, like you're talking more of like the launch process on Amazon, not or getting going with the supplier more. Uh, beyond the supplier. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll go into this for it, this could be a really long thing, but I'll I'll keep it pretty tight. But um, for me, like this is part of why having a brand is great. Is like I I do a lot of things to leverage existing products that you can't do from the very beginning. So 
I'm in a position where I can take a more patient approach, do these synergistic things, uh, you know, tap into audience, tap into frequently bought together, all these cross promotions, things like that. That's a little different if you're starting from scratch. So if you're starting from scratch, um, I would say like the, uh, the absolute mandatory things, like there's the mandatory and then there's everything on top of it. The mandatory things are, of course, having a great product differentiated, having your listing as conversion ready as possible from the very beginning. Um, such that when you start running traffic to it, paid traffic, any type of traffic, it's, it's converting. Uh, and um, I would say I would always start uh, PPC, that's pay-per-click, which is Amazon's sponsored platform, if anyone doesn't know. Uh, so that's where you can pay to show up. And uh, I always personally start that day one. That's something that a lot of people disagree with me on. A lot of people are like, oh, well, like, I don't have any reviews. But it's like, to me, it's like, we need to start getting traffic. We need to start gathering data. Uh, sure, it's going to convert a little bit worse. But you're going you're gonna to get some sales if you have, once again, a listing that is a good offer to people, if it makes sense. I never buy really anything with zero reviews, but people do. I, like, I've always managed to get like, some sales. Sure, it's going to convert worse, but you're, you're, you're getting the ball rolling. So that's like bare minimum. Uh, now. On top of that would be any sort of you know, launch service, build up an audience, promotion. And this is something that, uh, in my view, can vary a lot. Uh, meaning like, look, sometimes people come to me and they like, have a ton of background experience with like, uh, for example, building email lists or something. And like they've done that like in, in their job or in another business or whatever. That person should probably go that route. Like, so anything you can do to leverage something you have experience with, because um, there's, there's Instagram, there's Pinterest, there's, you know, uh, there's Facebook groups, there's Facebook ads, uh, there's whatever other platforms I didn't mention right there. And so what oh. you need is, what, you, what we ultimately want is traffic, right? So where the people are that might be interested in your product could vary. But uh, do something to build up that pre-launch people that will be interested uh, will be great. Now, one option that I like to really go into a lot with people is, um, and the reason that I like this one is because most people, from my experience, even me included, is like they're not going to do all this stuff from the beginning. Like, like probably one percent of people that actually get to the point of selling are like, you know, going to be like ready to go with like uh, all their own list and like their own following and social media and everything all connected and all like. That's just a lot. So one uh, avenue that I like to recommend and go to personally is uh, Facebook offer ads. So it's a very particular type of Facebook ad where you can distribute coupons. So you can basically do everything that a launch service can do, except you are doing it on your own, which mm -hmm. personally, I'm not a fan of the launch services uh, too much. Uh, but like the launch method makes sense. But I like to, I like to do it in a way that I can... Um, get my own people that are not in the pool of all the same people. So uh, the Facebook offer ad, it, it, look, it's, it's harder for sure. It's still harder than just like, you know, clicking a button and paying whatever, however much, but uh, it's still relatively low barrier to entry because you don't even need to have a landing page and email list. Like you can do all of that. You, you can do this Facebook offer ad distribution of coupons through a keyword URL without any assets. Like you can literally just create a Facebook page and start doing that the day your product arrives. So that's a big one, but uh, <laughs> that would be nice. that'd be something to consider. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, we always got a we always got the mic. Sorry. Uh, speaking of the uh, Facebook offer ad, I love it. It's so much cheaper than the launch service. I basically get a ton of coupons. Mm -hmm. You want to put that a little closer? So, so, yeah, thank you. So, yeah. Um, so, well, from my experience, like I, I do, a, I do a lot of different things at once. So, I, from what I gather, is like it's probably not a hundred percent the same, but it still seems to be working for sure. So, but yeah, the more you can do to like, and that's why like something like PPC or just any general marketing, like you, like don't be so laser focused on only one. Uh, you know, throw a lot of stuff, and then, and then if it works, you won't necessarily know if it was this or that that ranked you. But this could be a whole another rabbit hole. But like personally. While one keyword is important, to me, like ranking actually means uh, like the web of ranking, right? It's like, you know, one keyword is great, but the way people find stuff on Amazon is that they type in one keyword, they click on one listing, they click on 
a, a sponsored result, then they go to that listing, then they add it to their cart, then the cart recommends them another product, then they click to that one, then they go to the frequently bought together, and then they buy that. Like, I mean, people are just going crazy. So to me, it's like, how can we show up in everywhere, <laughs> right? Like to me, that is my definition of ranking. Uh, but if I'm gonna do something like an offer ad, I'm still gonna target one keyword or, or multiple keywords. Like you might spin it and uh, you know, you can, uh, you can AB your audience or you can do like, you know, this one for this period of time and then switch it over and try to attack another one. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, from what I hear from my own and from people that have done them very recently, seems to still be working. Uh, and those ones for the offer ad, I would typically be doing, you know, a deep discount, so. Gotcha. Um, what was the other question? In terms of valuation, uh, have you ever sold a brand? Uh, how do you evaluate that? Is it, like, what's the multiple in terms of selling? Right? Yeah, so I haven't sold a brand yet, but I think that even if you've even if you have no intention of selling the brand, you should be thinking about valuation and selling the brand because it's gonna make you build a better business that's more valuable to yourself. So, um, and well, at the core of it is literally like the brand model itself is already gonna be way more valuable. Like brands sell for bigger multiples. You know, random little like wholesale business. I mean, it's like, then it's just like pure multiple on earnings, probably relatively like, probably like a two X annual earnings on like, that's like kind of the low end. Uh, whereas like, you know, big brands, I mean like not Amazon brands, but big real brands that are valued at tons. I mean, they might sell for 10 X or, right. So, but in our world, it's more like two to three X sort of, but the more you're doing these, you're, you're, the more you're trickling down these real brand strategies into your Amazon brand and thinking of yourself as a product brand and doing these things that build audiences in different places and, and you have the cross promotion and maybe your product is ready to go into retail. I mean, these are things that would be very valuable to like a strategic acquirer that might, they might not know, like, because there's different kinds of buyers and I, I've never sold, so I'm not necessarily like a super expert in this, but like there are people that buy businesses just for the pure cash flow, And then there are people that buy them strategically because it works into their suite of other businesses or skills that they have. And you know, that's where you start seeing potentially much higher multiples is, is, is stuff like that. But yeah, I would say on average, it seems to be the two to three X and that's annual earnings. So that means if you do a hundred thousand in profit, your business is worth two to $300,000 plus inventory in stock, which is important to keep in mind because as you start ramping up, you're, you're going to have a lot of inventory in stock. So, uh, you know, looking at that as a, as a cash out method, uh, because these businesses tie up cash is, yeah. So it'd be like, you know, two to three X, three X, if you're doing these real brand things, doing all these other strategies, two X probably if you're, if you're doing less of that and then plus inventory. Yeah. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah, uh, you, just to add to that, actually in Zongu, which is our software, if you actually log into the business dashboard, we have a business valuation tool. So I think we're probably the one, one of the only in the space, but we, we do exactly that. We, we take, we analyze your net over, over whatever period you want, over 12 months, we add in your inventory, and then you can actually change your multiple. So hmm. it's a really cool way, you know, when you log in, you look at the dashboard, it shows you how much your business is worth on a daily basis, and, wow. you, and it just motivates you because you see that number hopefully going up and up and up, you know? That's cool. Um, and the really cool part as well is that it, it actually delivers a financial report to you on a monthly basis or when you want to pull it. Um, and actually, we have a, a link on there that connects with some of our partners, like we have Flipper, Empire Flippers. And basically, if you want to look at selling it, it'll connect with them and actually put, send your financial reporting to them. And that's, they're just like, this is amazing because to his point, like it, the, the, the X that you can put on your business is how you've actually built it. You know, do you have great relationships? Do you have good SOPs? You know, is it a great brand? You know, what is your history in terms of your, your sales and all that kind of stuff? So there's a lot that comes into it, but check out the tool and it'll show you exactly how to connect and, and look at that. Yeah. All right. So we've got like maybe a couple more questions. I know that there's one here and then maybe like two more and then we'll, and then we'll, then you guys can come up and chat and whatever. So just go be happy. I know you've spoke more than me on like sourcing agents and stuff like that. I've personally really used like Alibaba in fairly wide open places and I've had really good experiences with it. I think you can find kind of the suppliers we were talking about earlier, these ones that will grow with you. I've had good experiences. I've had some not so good experiences too, uh, but I've, I've found those caliber of suppliers through Alibaba. 
uh, personally. I haven't gone like I haven't gone to the Canton Fair. I haven't gone to I haven't used sourcing agents, but you could probably add something on that. But that could, those are sort of standard ways of finding stuff that's more what off. Sourcing agents are what uh, like the Canton, Canton fair, fair, like going to China. Yeah. Uh, they have like a fair uh, twice a year and yeah. tons of suppliers, and you can just you know pick stuff up, talk to talk to people, and those would definitely be ways to find stuff more off the grid. Uh, but I'm not personally very experienced with those. Um, as far as vetting suppliers, I mean, there's the there's the obvious uh, get samples. Uh, you're always going to get probably, you know, three four samples from different suppliers. For me, the number one is communication, and it's being able to like, can they understand what I'm looking for and what I want, and do they give me confidence that they're actually able to deliver on that? Like, I cannot I cannot deal with a supplier that I have trouble communicating with personally. Like, it, that's that's the number one. Uh, and, and also just their overall enthusiasm, enthusiasm around growing with you. All that stuff we were talking about earlier, that's huge. So for me, that's the most important thing on top of the fact that do they even have what I want? That's obviously the precursor is do they have what I want? And then above that is communication and how, um, how willing they are to really work with me and get me what I want and uh, to grow with me and instill confidence. And then that ties into the, the last question, which is not get screwed. Uh, you know, I've had some minor situations, but usually it's because of my own speed and lack of focus that I just jumped into some stuff and I didn't do inspections or this was like mistakes I made a long time ago. So, uh, yeah, you're, you'll do an inspection, uh, which is when you have like, uh, a team on the ground, will go to the factory, inspect all your stuff, send you this huge detailed report before you have it released. So when you're paying these suppliers, you can do like uh, the deposit and then the balance payment, typically it's like a 30% and 70% split. So 30% to get them started manufacturing your order. And then, you know, 30 days, 45 days, whatever it takes for that particular product. And then they're like, hey, it's done. You've been, you've been communicating with them to have your inspector show up at that time. You get the report before you pay the balance. So then you've already mitigated your risk to worst case scenario, only the deposit. So that's a big way to avoid getting scammed. And then you get this report and then, you know, based on the report, either they, either you say we're good to go, or there's a few small things we need to fix or worst case scenario is, you know, uh, well, depending on how you pay, you could potentially fight for your deposit back and just walk away from it. But even if that, even if that didn't exist, worst case would be the 30% and not the hundred percent. Right. Okay. So I'll touch on the second part first. So everything we're talking about is within the bounds of FBA, fulfillment by Amazon. So don't touch your own stuff. Uh, even if you had your own warehouse or whatever, uh, use Amazon because that's going to get you that, that prime tag and all that stuff. It's going to increase conversion. It's going to make everything. So that's the game we're playing um, just across the board. Uh, what was the first part of the question? Uh, I was asking about using your own site. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. Doing yeah. So. Um, that's viable for the future. But what I would say and what I practice is all these external method, methods of getting more traffic, use them to fuel Amazon because that's going to lead to more ranking in all those things, so, which will lead to more sales on Amazon. So rather than thinking, oh, I can you know, get these sales off, every sale on Amazon is like advertising for another sale on Amazon because if, you, if somebody buys on Amazon through that keyword, it's going to give that keyword more ranking power therefore you might get more sales out of it so i would say even if you set up you know set up all that stuff do all that stuff but for and also you can flip the switch later when you want but drive it to amazon because amazon is working and take advantage of that while you can and realize that there's roi from taking more sales on amazon like more sales leads to more sales it's exponential yeah yeah and people buy when they're on amazon that's your biggest conversion it's going to be plenty X more than, than any website. So, you know, drive everything to Amazon, convert there. They'll see it as, you know, selling more products and they'll spike your, your products as well. Um, great. Uh, let's go for two more questions if they are. We got any more? There's one way back. Yeah, go for it. Hey, man, thanks for coming in. Yeah. Uh, you drive home 
the importance of building, or sorry, first and foremost, Tom Wayne let me let you know that you were in fantastic shorts tonight. <laughs> we, we put the camera a little high, so you can't see it. Yeah. Um, you drive home the importance of building a brand, and we know that's an uphill battle, building brand equity on Amazon. Could you speak more to what you're doing off of Amazon when it comes to maybe um, generating, or just building a list maybe through ManyChat, or are you doing anything of when you scrape Amazon data and build a custom audience off of that and then build a lookalike audience. Yeah. Is there anything that you're doing, I guess, um, for that top of the funnel exactly. off of Amazon? Uh, that was kind of the answer. Uh, so I have I have followings around my brands on Instagram and Facebook, basically. And for Facebook, um, yeah, you can scrape the data, you can retarget. So I'll do that, which is a little bit of a gray area if you're if you're directly targeting your past customers. Uh, I I personally don't do any. I'm like very white hat, which means like a look like audience, right? Uh, so that would be like the cleanest way. Targeting your past customers, that's like maybe the lightest gray thing that I sometimes do. <laughs> I don't think of it as that bad. I mean, you have sold to them, and anybody could be getting that ad in theory. So I don't think that's like that big of a deal, personally. I don't know. Maybe you think differently. No, okay. <laughs> but I don't, think it's like, I don't think it's that gray, even. But technically, yeah. So I would use that to funnel building my audience. So that I look at as a completely not ROI-based thing. <laughs> like Basically, that's like to retarget, to like get them into my brand. So whether that's like potentially um, just retargeting uh, on whether it's a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad. And then inevitably, people start following, people start clicking, people start engaging just by retargeting. Because then they're like, oh, I bought this. I love it. Like, you know, it's, it's way easier than just like, oh, what the hell is this in my feed? They already are using it. <laughs> so uh, that feeds building the brands is the customers that I already have. Now, yes, lookalikes for anything that I'm going to do to cold. That's the best cold. That's the best cold audience. Meaning, so if anybody doesn't know, that means you're taking your existing customer list, uploading it into Facebook, basically telling Facebook, you know, use your crazy stalking methods to find people that are the closest to these people, and they're good at that, and uh, then target those people with an ad. Meaning, these people look like the people that buy my products, and show them an ad, get them into the cold. So, that, so if I'm going with the cold ad funnel, that's going to be the top of it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Gotcha. All right. Last question, all the way in the back. I have heard of people doing that. So you mean like doing a, almost like a, not like a gift basket, but like all different brands, of, like not your own products, right? Like in doing a big giveaway to build up emails. Yeah, so and stuff. if someone buys a specific product on Amazon, I would like to offer mine for free to that person, just to try to build that relationship and get them to buy it. Hmm. Uh, I, I have not done that. So I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure I have a great answer to that. Uh, but it sounds interesting. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, I, I think from a bundling perspective, uh, it's it's not the best. But sometimes to differentiate your product, if you are more in in the, in the consumable space, is to to add a, a product to it as a, as a giveaway or something like that, which helps to differentiate. Um, so that's one thing to try. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't tried that either. Yeah, yeah. Well, the last question, you kind of stumped us. So, well, well, uh, yeah. Do we end there or do we end on a good one? <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I, think, I, think we're, I think we're good. I mean, if you guys have any other questions, maybe we can end with, with Matt. Maybe if there's any last thing that you would like to say to these guys or anything that you want to end on. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess just circle back to that, like, that core point of like, basically nobody even gets to the point of selling something on Amazon. So just do that. <laughs> like whether, even, if you, even if that means losing a few bucks, get to that point. I'll say that. Uh, I'll say follow me on YouTube if you haven't. And uh, yeah, this was great. And thanks for having me and thanks for coming out. Awesome.